The world is smaller and a lot more connected than we think. It's quite possible for you to go outside to a cafe, drink a coffee that was made out of Colombian beans, while listening to K-pop and browsing your iPhone that was probably made in China. Now, what is the best thing though about being so closely connected with one another? Well, let me tell you, it's all about the accessibility when it comes to watching gameplay from other regions. Now, that's something quite honestly, up until about a little over a decade ago, we didn't really have so reliably, you know? So in today's video, we'll be going over a VOD played by none other than Rank 10 EUS, and I might butcher this, Solarhi Voltirix, where his incredibly strange yet intriguing playstyle netted him a top four within a 1000 plus LP EU West Challenger Lobby. Now, before we start the video, I do need to give a quick disclaimer. I don't understand a lot of decisions this guy makes. And quite honestly, I will probably be critiquing and questioning a lot of his gameplay. And to be fair, I am a North American player. I play on the NA server. So, you know, their meta and our meta and the way that we approach the games are very, very different from one another. And, you know, the thing is though, this guy's a thousand LP above me, right? So he's clearly doing something right. But that's why I wanted to create this video. Now, different regions breed different playstyles, different methodologies, different ways of thinking the game and how to approach it, right? And, you know, that's what's so beautiful about watching gameplay from other regions because we get to really learn from one another in a way that we would never be able to if we were to just stay isolated onto our own servers. Now, I want you guys to really try to play detective with me. So not only that you can help me out, but so we can help each other out, you know, and try to understand the methodology behind how this man approaches TFT. Alors, on est là, c'est bien mes amis, et bienvenue en France, and let's get on to the video. Alright, so here we are, we are inside of Mr. Voltriux's game. Uh, now listen, I'm gonna say Mr. Volt from now on because I, I think I'm pronouncing it right, but quite honestly, I have not spoken French in a very long time, so I'm just gonna say Mr. Volt, make it easier for us, okay? So here we see the bow start off of 2-1, and the bow start is probably because we are seeing Infinity Team in the meta right now, and because Infinity Team's in the meta, that means Sure Shot's in the meta, that means AD is in the meta. So whenever AD is in the meta, bow start tends to be the best opener just because you can do GS, Last Whisper, Runans, a lot of great items that a lot of AD carries are allowed to use. Now, we're going to speed up a little bit throughout the opener here because there's not much to really talk about until the 2-1 augment, but we can see that, you know, right off rip, we have no carousels, or not, sorry, we have no upgrades, nothing that great, but we do have an infinite team start, which is kind of great for us. But with that being said, let's go into our augment choices here at 2-1. Now, we have Duel's Heart, Celestial Blessing, Luden's Echo, and again, just to remind you, we have zero upgraded units. Zero upgraded units, we do have the strongest opener, but everything is one star. And I don't think we're even sitting on very many pairs, if any. So it's definitely going to be a loose streak angle, even if we do have an Infinity Team start. So if we are loose streaking, you know, probably don't want to, you know, combat augments are nice, but we don't have to take them, right? And if we're loose streaking, that usually means that we're going to be a lot more flexible as we approach the mid to late game. So you want to take a generic augment here that can fit basically into any sort of team. And well, when you look at the options here, really Celestial Blessing is the only correct option that we can really take from this spot. And you know, like, I mean, what else are you going to take here, right? We have zero Duelist. Duelist Heart doesn't make any sense. Luden's Echo is great for AP lines. We have a Shiv on bench. Doesn't really make sense. So here, we are just going to be loose streaking here, taking CB. And again, you see, we have no pairs, no nothing. We're just going to try to loose streak here, try to make econ and focus on building up our economy. So far, so good. Everything here, like nothing here is like odd or strange, right? But I mean, you know, it's fine. It is what it is. Now, we're just going to try and fast forward here a little bit. Now, we do get the Lucian pair here. Now, I think this is where things get a little bit weird. Here, he slams a shiv. I don't get it. And the reason why is because, yes, we did win the first round. But if we win the first round, then, okay, you think your spot is good enough to streak, then you would probably level the 4 here, right? But he doesn't. He doesn't level the 4 here, and then he has items slammed, even though he's trying to lose streak. Now, you could argue that maybe, okay, maybe the lobby is just so strong that even if he slams these items, he can still lose streak. And, you know, that's justifiable. That's totally okay. But... You know, I don't, I don't know if I fully agree with that, right? Because the thing is, is that as he's scouting this lobby, it's, I mean, it's not super strong. It's not super weak, but it's not super strong, right? But, you know, again, he has the item slams here, but I guess he's thinking, okay, maybe I can preserve my HP while trying to play this line. And, you know, the shift slam is fine. Playing around TF, you're kind of locking yourself in pretty early into the TF line, but I mean, 
it's okay. He has an infinity team start. So, so far, you know what? I kind of get it. HP preservation. Okay, makes sense. Whatever. We're gonna, you know, just fast forward a little bit here. Probably gonna look for some tank items off Carousel because he has an open belt on his Pantheon. Which we see he takes the chain and belt. Now, this part also makes no sense to me. He has, look, let's look at his board. He has two Pantheon 1s, Lucian with Shiv, and a Sivir. Right, his board is still weak, still trying to lose streak, right? So what would you do in this spot? Would you slam anything? Probably not, right? You probably wouldn't slam anything because you want to preserve your streak, right? And again, the lobby's not too strong. But then we see he slams a Warmox. Now, why is this strange? Right, from a North American perspective, why is this strange? It's strange because Warmogs has very little value late game. It has value, obviously. 800 HP is 800 HP. But 800 HP is a lot in the early game. It's a lot. So if you're trying to maintain a loose streak, and you think that the lobby is so strong that you need to slam something in order to preserve some level of HP, Sunfire makes way more sense. It's not as effective early game, but it ensures that you have an anti-heal option for late game. And Warmogs, again, the value of Warmogs comes from the early game. 800 HP is a lot to burn through, especially in the early game. So if you're slamming Warmogs, you really should be win streaking early game. You really should be win streaking early game or positioning, positioning yourself, rather, sorry, to win streak. But here we're on a two loss. We should be continuing our loss streak. So this is what I find very odd. But if anybody can, you know, try to point me in the right direction and try to get me to understand what the thought process is behind this, then... Um, Please go ahead. The only thing I can think of is Warmogs into Gargoyles. Because that's a very, very strong combination. But even then, it's like... You'd probably rather... Like... Wouldn't you rather have Sunfire open Belt? And then just play into, like... Redemption? Or something else? Like, I feel like you have a lot more better options than this... This Warmogs here. Here, he still is maintaining his logic, which is great. So, so far, so good. But, as we can see here, this is the part that makes no sense to me as well. Again... A lot of things don't make sense for me when I'm watching this gameplay. Now, here, he gets the Pantheon 2. He has an extra Pantheon, and he still has Infinity Team with a Lucian 2. Lucian 2, Pantheon 2 with a Warmogs on top of the Hex. That's a front row Hex. Now, his board's really strong. His board's really strong. And if we play at regular speed, we can see that he actually scouts the lobby here as well in just a little bit. But, I mean, after, you know, he figures out his Econ. But, if you notice he scouts the lobby, this board is piss weak. This board fucking sucks. This is a terrible board. Same with this board. I mean, this board's a little better. He's got Ginsu Shift Slam. It's, you know, decently strong, but he only ha he has no quick draws, just admin. Um, obviously, we don't know what the admin is because I don't think he hovers over it. But he also has, by the way, Infinite Team Heart with this board. Look, what the fuck is going on over there? I don't want to know what's going on over there. Uh, but, you know, our board is way stronger than those two. Of course, there's Mr. 100 we have to worry about, but Mr. 100 we're probably going to lose to anyway. So, you know, assume that's an auto loss, right? But the other two, if we want to maintain this loose streak and keep valuing our economy here, if I were him, I would maybe switch my my tier 1 Pantheon, the one without the Warmogs, onto the front row Hex, and then maybe play Silas instead of this tier 2 Pantheon. Just really ensure that you hit that 4 loss because your streak money carries over into neutrals. So you actually make a lot of money through PvE, even though you're not playing against anybody, right? But as we can see here, he doesn't do that. He plays his strongest board. And then... To no surprise, he ends up winning this fight. He ends up winning this fight. So, that makes no sense to me. Because it's like it's like a clash of identities. It's like you want to play your strongest board, but you're also trying to lose streak, but then you just lost your streak. You just lost like four gold here. Because you didn't get the streak gold, and you didn't get the streak gold going into neutral. So you just lost four gold here, right? Which is really, really strange. Now, Obviously, though, because now we're on a win streak, we can try to streak from the spot. And as we can see, we do have an open cloak on bench. Open cloak on bench is great here because, I mean, Gargoyle Warmox is probably the strongest early item slams for uh, early game tanks. So having Gargoyle Warmox here and then trying to win streak from this spot, totally okay, I can understand. You could argue that he knew he was going to start win streaking, so he wanted to start winning anyways and just start the win streak like a turn early. But you lose so much gold through the loose streak that you would have had into Krugs that I just don't think that it was worth it. But again, I could be wrong. Here we can also see he plays the Sona and the Annie, and sure, it is the strongest board, but this actually also tailors his augments. 
in case it's a hero augment in case because you know you want to play tf and having spell slinger infinity team in there is really really good for your hero augments he's this is a wonderful job so this is this i totally agree with on this 3-1 now we are going to speed up a little bit here we're going to talk about the 3-2 augments and now we're going into 3-2 and now look we're trying to win streak from their spot right we're trying to win streak so which of these augments would we take from the spot now if you remember from the dish soap video we want to derive combat power from our augments immediately if we want to preserve a win streak, right? Now, if we just do a little bit of math, Stand United gives us 7.5 AD AP across our whole team. Eh, kind of sucks. Sculpt weapons, I mean, it's a pretty obvious not no-go, right? It buffs only like half your units, and even then that's like assuming that you're playing like three units in your backline. It's 10% attack speed, it's a bow, right? Personally, I would take Sunfire Board from the spot. And the reason why is because Sunfire Board, he didn't slam Sunfire, uh, whatever the fuck, Sunfire Cape earlier. So it makes perfect sense to take Sunfire Board. So now you have anti heal already, right? But admittedly, you're sort of saying, okay, I'll have some combat power now, but I'll have a lot more utility, utility sorry, later. So you'll have the anti heal later, and it's already teched in for you through your augments, and that's okay. I think Sunfire Board here is a great, very great choice. But if you want to reroll for a stronger augment that'll give you more immediate power now, that is an understandable decision. And as we can see here, I believe he thinks about it, but then he does reroll the augments, and now you're given a session, trade sector, and jewel lotus. As we said before, we want combat power. So trade sector, probably not what we want at the moment, is either ascension or jeweled lotus. Now, why would we ever take one over the other? Now you can just look at the stats and say, okay, Jewel Lotus is the way to go because it averages like a 4.3 versus Ascension is 4.6. But is that really the correct decision? Well, in this case, yes. And the reason why is because Jewel Lotus, you can think of it as basically giving your entire team a JG. You know, you don't get the AP along with it, but you, your whole team basically gets the crit. It's a very, very strong immediate combat power augment now. And plus, when we think about the identity of Infinity Team, because that seems to be the direction of our board at the moment, when we think about the identity of Infinity Team, Ascension does not fit very well with its identity. What Now, you know, what is the identity of Infinity Team, you might ask? Well, the idea behind Infinity Team is that you just have a crap load of units. Just this large quantity of just, quite honestly, mid units. They're not great, but you have so many that they sort of just like beat down and just soften up the opponent's board and then Ezreal just fucking shoots his load I mean whoa shoots his whoa shoots his ult oh god all over the board ew but that you know it, it you know it cleans everything up that's the whole idea the fight should be over very very quickly wow um <laughs> we're just gonna ignore that this is like my third take I'm not gonna do another take but anyways the idea is Soften up the board, Ezreal cleans, and we're done. That should be it, right? And the Jewel Lotus really helps cleaning everything up, plus the immediate power. Now, it fits in both with what we're looking for now and the identity of our board later on. So Jewel Lotus is always the correct choice from the spot. I swear to God, there's always a motorcyclist in at least one of these recordings, and they're so freaking loud. I swear they have the tiniest peepees ever, but it's fine, whatever. Anyways, take Jewel Lotus here great choice and here we are going to push to six because again we're trying to win streak and we're just trying to tech into our strongest board which happens to be this defender hard spell sling or whatever board right and here quite honestly there's not much to talk about this is sort of the same as like dish soap's video here where stage three our board is really really strong we're in a pretty good spot right now it's not like the strongest of boards right we have like a wukong one or a board but quite honestly this board is really really strong and especially with the infinity team clone we can see that, you know, it pushes a lot of power into our board by having that extra unit. You're basically playing up, like, half a fawn because you get an extra unit. So, quite honestly, the board here is really, really strong. So, we're going to be breezing through all of Stage 3, really. And, quite honestly, uh, I can actually just... I think this is 8x speed. Like, this is so fast. But, like, there's not much to talk about here, quite honestly. Here, he high rolls a TF on 3-5. What are we going to do here? We're on a four win streak. We are going to push level. We're going to push level. We're going to keep the tempo going. Here we have TF on our board. We now have five infinity team. And again, we're going to just fast for the crap out of this because there's nothing to talk about. He's just going to keep win streaking. He's going to preserve his streak and he's doing perfectly fine. I agree with all of this. This makes perfect sense in my North American low elo brain. Now, 
as we keep going, we're gonna again we're gonna speed up because this is on eight x speed and there's nothing to talk about. There's nothing to talk about. He's gonna win streak all the way throughout the stage, playing perfectly fine. This makes total sense. Now, as we are going on with this board, now you might be wondering, or as we're going on with this game, you might be wondering like, why am I reviewing this game, right? Why am I reviewing an Infinity Team game? What's the point? Infinity Team is the meta. It's clearly the meta, right? So what's so intriguing or weird about his playstyle? Well, like I said in the previous video, strange lines and weird boards, especially in higher elo lobbies, are usually a byproduct of serendipity, all right? At the higher end of the competitive level, you're almost always playing around the meta comps and then adjusting the situation or adjusting towards the situation that you naturally find yourself in, okay? Now, here as we can see, he has the Archangel Slam on the TF. And again, the board's very, very strong. We're in a very, very strong very very strong spot at the moment so here you know infinity Team's the meta he's playing a meta board he's just gonna keep win streaking his board is very very strong there's not much to talk about now for two is when things start to get a bit more interesting right we're not at the super interesting part yet but it gets a bit more interesting so here let's talk about the augment choices here so here we have woodland charm curse crown cybernetic shell now if the lobby is very ad heavy which it's not i can tell you that off rip it's not very ad heavy lobby Cybershell would be a great choice here. And Cybershell, actually, I believe by the stats, has a very, very good average. I, I believe it's a 4.1. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. But actually, you know what? I can check right now. Um, It is a 4.36 at 4.2. It's a very strong augment, especially in 80 heavy lobby. So definitely don't sleep on Shell. But two things here. Woodland Charm, Curse Crown. Now, the average for Woodland Charm is disgusting. It's a 4.15 at 4.2. But we also have Crush Crown as an option. Personally speaking, I can see both lines. I can understand why you'd go one or the other. Now let's talk about why. Curse Crown, the reason why you might take Curse Crown is because you are win streaking right now. And on top of that, you are playing an affinity team board. What did we talk about earlier? We we're talking about the identity of a composition, right? And why that's important and why when we're taking our augments, we need to think about the identity of the direction of our board and how that can complement that so that we can keep pushing power into our board. Cursed Crown here is really great because the whole identity of Infinity Team is just duplicating, making clones, right? So if we take Cursed Crown here, we're basically saying, hey, not only are we going to have two extra clones because of five Infinity Team, we're going to have an extra two units on our board. So we have four extra units on our board. And we're just gonna swarm you with this quantity of mid units, right? And then when Ezreal throws that fucking pulse fire all over the board, it just cleans everything up. Curse Crown is a very, very great choice in this spot, actually. And you can argue that Woodland Charm is still better, though. Why is that the case? Curse Crown gives you two extra units, right? But why would Woodland Charm might potentially be better from this spot? Woodland Charm can be better from this spot because of two reasons. One, it's a lot safer. There's a lot less risk involved when it comes to Woodland Charm, but also Woodland Charm gives you that extra unit anyways. You don't get two extra units, you get one extra unit, but you get it for free. You you just have your board and it just clones a unit. So you're saving, let's say it clones a two-star four cost. Saves you like 12 gold. That's a lot of money. So taking Woodland Charm here is totally fine. It still plays into the identity of Infinity Team. It's a little less risky. It, there's a bit less reward. But it's definitely not a bad option from the spot, nonetheless. So taking Woodland Charm or Curse Crown from the spot, both are terrific options in my opinion. So it depends on your play style, right? If you if you want a little less risk, maybe go with the Woodland Charm. If you want a little more risk and a little more high reward, go with Curse Crown. You can play Fast 9 if you manage to streak out through Stage 4 and just go crazy at level 9, right? But here as we can see... Uh, based off his playstyle, I believe he thinks about Curse Crown here. He's like, you can see he's a little conflicted, but I believe he ends up going with Woodland Charm because, you know, I mean, it's not a bad option, right? Again, it's a safer option. It's easier to play. Now, from this spot, we are on a seven win streak with 76 gold. Personally, I would level to level eight and I would roll down and try to hit my two cost units. The reason why is because we are on a streak. Most of our units are decent enough. We're already sitting on one TF. We only need two more. 4-2 is very early, so you have sort of first dibs when it comes to the four costs. So I would actually argue leveling to leveling to eight here and rolling down to zero and zeroing out and maintaining your streak is probably the correct way to go. But I can also understand if you don't want to level to eight here. And we're going to see here that he actually chooses not to level to eight. And the reason why is because right now on his board, he has... 
a Kaisa, Lucian 2, he has a Sona. There are a lot of better things you could throw onto this board, right? And the more things you need to throw in, and ideally these, by the way, the units that he wants to throw in, ideally they're upgraded to tier 2. That's a lot of money. So I actually, understandably, can see why he chooses not to level here. And instead, decides to sack 2. Yes, you lose your streak, it sucks. But build up more money through your interest gold, and then on 4, 5, level to 8, and roll down. That would be an American approach to this spot. That is how I would approach it. That is how I believe a lot of NATFT players would approach it. Because you're trying to keep up your pace of the lobby, keep up the tempo of the lobby. You're the one deciding the tempo. So if you're the one who's pushing forward to level 8, everybody else has to do that at 4, 5. And if their econ or their spot is not as good as yours, you have an advantage, right? That is the American approach. But as we're going to see here, this is where things get kind of strange. And this is the part where I start to really start to question a lot of the decision making here. But we're going to see why in just a little bit. Now, we're going to fast forward a little bit here. And again, remember what I said, 4, 5, we are probably rolling down to 0, hitting all our upgrades, and then trying to save up to go 9. That is sort of the American approach here, okay? That is the American approach. So, what? He's 94 gold, right? But he's still level 7. So what does he decide to do here? Push level 8. Terrific. Agreed. That's it? This guy slams Archangels. He has two Archangels and a Shiv. And he's 45 gold at level 8. Or 51 gold at level 8. With this... I'm going to rewind it a little bit. Sorry. Hold on. I'm trying to remember my keybinds. With this board... He wants to go level 9 with this board. And he's going to try to fast 9. I don't know about you guys. But I look at this board and I go, holy fuck, this is dog shit. For a level 8 board? This is not great. Your carry. Whoever it is right now. I mean, it's supposed to be TF. But he has the Shiv on Lucian. Archangel's on a TF. Archangel's on a, on a Ace Soul. And a Misfortune with no items. This board looks terrible. And the fact that he doesn't roll down here is insane to me. Because in an American TFT sort of competitive setting, you will see a lot of people roll down a 4, 2, 4, 5 at level 8. And the reason why is because if you wait too long, you lose priority over the 4 cost because they're being taken out of the pool. And especially units like TF, who are popular in Infinity, popular in Nico TF duo carry, popular in duelist comps, right? It's a very popular unit. So if you can get to level 8 first and roll down faster than anybody else, you have a higher chance of actually finding those TFs because there's still all of them in the pool. But if you wait too long, you lose your priority. And this is the part that I don't understand. Now, you could be like, oh, sure. He's going to go level 9. He's going to try to fast 9 with his board. And maybe, maybe the tempo of the lobby and the pace of the lobby is so slow that he's allowed to do this. But at a 1,000 LP challenger, listen, unless EUS is fucking Disneyland, which I don't think it is, that's not going to fly. And as you can see here, his board loses. Now, you might think, okay, he's falling behind the, temp the pace a little bit. What is he going to do here? Surely, he's just going to save money. Surely, he's going to save money here and then try to go 9, right? No. He buys the shop, rolls, and then sits again. So now we're thinking, okay, maybe he wants to slow roll at 8 to try to hit his upgrades. Why? This makes no sense to me. This is a very, very greedy play. And why is it so greedy? The reason why it's greedy is because, again, you're losing priority. You are losing access to the units that you actually might need, right? You're playing sort of an Infinity Team board your entire game. It's stage 5. It's stage 5 and you're playing around a potentially... Or I'm potentially playing Infinity Team, right? That is the idea here. You're play, trying to play around the strongest comp of the game. Understandable. But you've lost a lot of priority. It's now 5-1. It's 5-1. You're still 50 gold and you still lost your priority. At this point, by the way... If he keeps slow rolling, he's, he only rolled once. That's fine. But he also upgraded the a -soul, so he lost a little more gold there. So if he wants to fast 9, he has to commit to it. And you remember what we said about the dish soap video? If you make a game plan, you got to commit to it, right? But if the game plan is to slow roll at 50, it's 
I'm not going to say it's a bad game plan, but it's not a great game plan. And the reason why, again, you lose your priority. You're sort of... The, here's the biggest problem with it, right? The biggest problem with this is that because you are slow rolling and trying to hit these units out of thin air, you're sort of... Because everybody else took the good ones out of the pool, you're sort of left flexing around whatever units you end up hitting. And because, you know... In a perfect world, if TFT was perfectly balanced, this is totally okay. And the reason why is because everything would be balanced, right? No matter what two-star, four-cost AP line you're playing, you, it should be relatively balanced, right? Especially with a no-hero augment lobby, right? But that's not the case. TFT is naturally and will forever be inherently slightly unbalanced, right? It's human nature. The game only lasts about three months, and then we have a new set every single time. Well, now it's going to be four months. It's a 10 waiting room. But until then, like, it'll never be perfectly balanced. So you really need to prioritize sort of the meta comps and the meta units. And it sucks that that's the case. It doesn't give you a super large disadvantage. It's a slight disadvantage. But that slight disadvantage adds up when you think about, okay, well, now you have to play a little bit of a worse AP carry. You have to play a little bit of a worse tank line or a front line. And you're sort of just forced to flex into these options that, you know... Are not meta and you know again it might be like oh meta slave meta slave whatever but you know comps are meta for a reason they're meta for a reason and it's because they are so so strong or uh, rather they give you a bit more of an edge a bit more of a competitive advantage when you get to play these meta comps now as we can see here he rolled down a bit and now it's like, okay, cool, well, you could have fast 9 but instead of fast 9 now you have decided to roll down at level 8 instead. But now you have these sort of crap units that aren't as good. Right? Like, Aatrox is a great unit. Like, in a vacuum, he's a great unit. But there's no real good comp that plays around Aatrox, right? And he's sort of flex, and you can flex around him or whatever, but now we're stuck with, you know, with an Aesol carry without the Aesol hero augment. We have an Aatrox 2. We have some weird Fiora 1, TF1 board going on here. Like, it's very strange, right? And I think you can sort of guess that at a certain point, goodbye TF. Hello, goodbye TF. We're not playing around TF anymore. We're not even playing around Infinity Team anymore. Our game plan that we could have had and that strong meta board that we could have had, that opportunity has been lost because there was too much time taken in order to try and greed our economy. We didn't go in Fast 9. We didn't try to flex around Infinity Team, or we didn't try to play around Infinity Team by trying to keep our priority high. Instead, we sort of slow rolled at 50. We hit Aesol 2, Aatrox 2, cool, I guess. But this board, you know, you have you don't have an Aesol with Shoujin either. You have also three Archangels on the board. Unless Archangels is super broken, someone please explain to me why this is the case. I understand he has Jewel Lotus, but these fights are not lasting very long. This fight lasted maybe 20 seconds. Maybe 20 seconds, right? You could argue it lasted a little longer than that, but I mean, everything was dead within 20 seconds, right? Like, the fights are not lasting very long. His front line is very, very weak. Sure, he has Woodland Charm to help him extend the fights, but it's it's not, you know, it's not that great, right? Now, again, I've never played on the EUS servers. I've only seen a handful of EUS games, if, you know, more than five, right? So the meta is probably very different compared to ours, and it's possible he's playing the most optimal version of TFT for their region specifically. Now, I don't understand all the nuances, all the decisions, but that's why I'm creating this video because I want to hear other opinions in this spot, right? Like, cultures and different ideas and identities and languages breed different types of gameplay. And now, listen, I may be criticizing this a lot and I'm saying, hey, this makes no fucking sense to me, but dude, this dude's like, he's 1100 LP here. He has 1100 LP here. And he's clearly doing something right that I clearly don't understand. So again, if you, you know... If you're watching this and you're like, no, this makes perfect sense to me, please. I want, I want to hear your opinions because I don't get it, right? I, I genuinely do not understand. But now, the only argument that I can see being made is that he's really trying to match the tempo of the lobby. Now, what does that mean? He's really saying, I'm only going to roll until my board is just about as strong as the pace of the lobby. And I'm going to try to go nine no matter what. That is the only thing I can understand when I watch this gameplay. It seems that there's a very high emphasis and a high priority on level 9, but there isn't enough of an emphasis when it comes to making sure that your board is really strong and really, you know, 
really competitive enough to maintain winning, right? And maintain not losing your HP. And whether that's a difference within culture or a difference within the playstyle across regions, I don't know. But even if that is the case, sure, he has managed to secure a top four lobby or top four within this lobby. And I'll be granted, he's been playing pretty flexibly. Most of his units are now upgraded on his board. But look at the synergies, right? He itemized the Leona 1 over an Echo 2 or an Aatrox 2 for that matter. He has a random Urgot on his board, which if you know anything about the current meta, Urgot by himself without any tier items, not that great because he takes forever to cast, right? But he does have a Syndra on his board with Echo, so at least it does give him Star Guardian so he can sort of play up a Fawn, if you will. But as you can see here, even if he's trying to match the pace of the lobby here, watch this round here. Watch how fucking awfully this guy gets diffed. Look at this. This is a... How, how big of a loss is this? This is a... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 unit loss. He's 27 HP at the moment. 27. He lost 14 HP during stage 5. He's now down to 1 life. If he truly was matching the pace of the lobby, maybe a 1-2 unit loss, maybe a 1-2 unit win, sure, I understand. But that's clearly not what's going on here. And now here we can see he secures the top 3, luckily, because the other guys are taking out the competition. But clearly he's not doing his part in clearing out the competition. Again, he's sitting at 56, he's sitting at like 50 gold here. He's sitting at 50 gold here, he understands that he cannot, he's not even close to the first guy playing. So like, what should he do here, right? Should he try to go level 9? No, of course not. You can't even go level 9 in this spot. What is your out? <clears throat> what is your out? You go level 9 here and you tech in like a fiddlestick. Is that really going to save your board from a 6-7 seven, seven unit loss? No, of course not. So what is your out here? It's a 3 star 4 cost. That's your best bet. Your best bet here is a 3 star 4 cost. And by the way, this MF is not doing anything. She provides ace, but that's only assuming she actually casts. So this MF is not even doing very good here, right? Here we can see he takes off with the Leona, which is great. I heavily agree with that. But as we can see here, like this board is so odd. And you can see that like this board came to be because of these weird decisions, right? That again, maybe it makes perfect sense in EU West and somebody can comment and explain the reasoning, but this shit makes no sense from a North American perspective. And that's why I'm so genuinely curious as to why this sort of playstyle works. Right? And as we can see here, he's going to start rolling down, trying to hit the Ace 3 And he, you know, he has a load of dice from the Carousel, so maybe he can hit, but as we can see here, rolls down, doesn't hit. He, you know, <laughs> loaded dice is the Ace Ult, doesn't hit. He's two off. That's why I'm playing around Ace 3 when calling, that's totally fine. But as we can see here again, his front line is so odd. He has a Shen 2 for fun. The Shen 2 has zero traits active. Now you could argue, oh, he's rolling down, you didn't see it. But, like, this board is so odd. And yet, look, it's still working. And here, we can see here, he has, again, two Aatrox 2s. Oh, I mean, it's one Aatrox 2, but he has Woodland Charm, right? He has this Shen for fun, sells the MF. Look at this board. What is this thing? Look at his... Just think about this. He has Aesol 2... Ace Ult 2, Aatrox 2, Aatrox 2, Aatrox 2, Echo 2, Sinja, Urgot 2, Fiddlesticks. He basically just has four upgraded threats. And like, Echo, Sinja for Star Guardian. But that only buffs them. This board is so strange. This game could have easily, I believe, could have been a first. Had he had played around Infinity and had he played around TF and trying to prioritize the TF and the Infinity line. But instead, as we can see, he there was some sort of ambivalence at level 8 where he just stayed 50 gold and he kind of like slow rolled. And as we can see here, strangely enough, he wins. I mean, this is a ghost. He's even surprised. He's even surprised by this outcome. And it's a top 2. And they could be like, oh, okay, well, you know, it's a two-star threat, two-star four cost, two-star four cost, two-star five cost, two-star four cost, two-star five cost, two-star four cost, whatever. A lot of upgrades on this board. Finally. But what I'm saying is that he arrived at this board due to what I believe, from a North American perspective, are mistakes. Now, again, you can argue I'm incorrect. 
you can argue that I don't know what I'm talking about. And that's totally okay. That's what this video is about. Because I want to understand why. The decision making in the end game made very little sense from a North American perspective. And I leave you with the question, why? Was he just super high roll from like mid game? And that's why he was able to do such a thing. Was he trying to keep up with the pace of the lobby? Like, I don't fully grasp the decision making that was put into this gameplay. But hey, that's top two. That's top 1000 LP of E West. So take care, guys. Happy climbing.